I'm going to take your Bibles with me once again to that, that passage is in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis in chapter 3. And as you turn there, I'm going to read a few verses from the book of Psalms. Psalm, Psalm 8. We've been looking at the subject that we find here in, in Psalm 8, verse number 4. The fourth verse of Psalm 8, the Word of God reads, What is man that thou, that God, is mindful of him? And the Son of Man that thou visitest him? What is man that the God of all the universe would think about us? What is man? Now this is a question that a lot of people are asking today. The philosophers are asking it. The scientists are asking it. The doctors are asking it. But for some reason, nobody seems to be able to answer it coherently. Everyone's coming up with ideas that are unscientific, unbiological, uh, are, are hurting people, are hindering people things that are philosophically causing issues in our society, the fragmentation of society, the breakups of home, the confusion of children, the corruption of governments. So much of it is coming down to this question that no one seems to be able to answer. What is man? What's interesting is, the answer to that question is not best answered by looking within ourselves. We can spend the time and the pursuit and the energy to learn a lot about mankind and about ourselves with self-introspection. We can. There's a lot that is observable that we can, we can learn and study. If, if we were to have some sort of crazy thing like a, a phone or something, and to throw it back 2,000 years to the time of Christ, and let's say some random man picked it up, what would they think about the phone? Well, they could study it, and they could learn a few things about it, and they could try to understand it. But it would be far better to take that phone and to take it to the man who invented it and say, what is this? How do I use it? And allow the man who made the phone to explain this is really what we do as we come to God and we say to God, the one who designed us, the one who created us, the one who made us fearfully and wonderfully, the Bible says. It is far better than to look at ourselves and say, who am I? To ask Him and say, who am I? What is man? Sometimes the, the study of, of man they call anthropology. The study of man. But this is a great question. What is man? Now, over the last couple weeks, we've seen the origin of man. In Genesis, the Word of God tells us in chapter number 1 that God made man. God made man male and female. Two sexes. Male and female. That's it. We made the point that there may be confused men and there may be confused women who think they're something else, but ultimately... We understand that there are men and there are women. God made male, God made woman. He made us, and He made us in the image of Himself. In other words, we are image bearers. We are like Christ in that, and like God in that, that we ought to, all mankind for that matter, not just believers, we bear the image of God, the impression, the, the designership of God on us. And we are distinct because of that from all the rest of creation. We've seen that, the origin of man. We've seen the dominion of man in chapters number 1 and also chapter number 2 of Genesis, that mankind has been given a, a work to do, a responsibility prior to the fall. Sorry for those of you who don't like working, but prior to the fall, God created us with a task. Ultimately, that task was to live a life for His glory, to work for His purpose, to work for the name of God, to please Him and to commune with Him and to have a relationship with Him. But God also put us on this earth as 
as those who are to care for it. He put man in the garden, the Garden of Eden, to dress it and to keep it. But now we come to the point in human history where everything goes chaos, haywire, upside down, where all of humanity is dumped out into a big old mess on the floor. We call that the fall of man. When you read the book of Genesis, it starts out really good. It starts out really encouraging. God has made a world. God has filled the world with, with water and, and earth, and He's filled it with trees and plants and vegetation and beautiful things to behold. He's filled it with wonderful, powerful animals. Animals including the dinosaurs that would walk the face of this earth. Birds that would soar in the sky. Animals and, and creatures that could swim to the depths of the water. What an incredible thought. And then, as God completes His creation, He makes man. The crown of His creation. And then, to make it even better, He makes the crown of man. The crown of His crown, He makes woman. Everything's perfect. The Bible says there in Genesis 1.31, and God saw everything that He had made. And behold, it was very good. God made a perfect world. A very good world. It was, it was, it was absolutely impeccable. Like nothing that you and I have ever experienced. This world was beautiful. And the Lord made man. He planted a garden, and He put man and woman in there, and He gave them a task, He gave them things to do. All was very wonderful. It was very good. But quite obviously, this is not the world in which we live. You and I don't live in a world where it's safe to walk amongst the lions. We do not live in a world where we have no war where we have no starvation, where we have no strife, where we have no bloodshed, where we have no wickedness, we have no failure, we have no shortcomings. That was the world in the Genesis account in Genesis 1 and 2. There was, there was nothing bad. But you and I live in a world where there is war. We live in a world where there is knife crime. We live in a world where there is cancer. We live in a world where little children die without seeing but the light of day. We live in a world where there is suffering and trial and torment and hardship. Why? Where did this come from? Where, When I read Genesis, all is perfect. When I look at the world, all is broken. How did this happen? How could there be a God? This is a question we get a lot. How could there be a God in such an evil world? That's a question people ask us. They, they think it's a real stumper. Man, get those Christians. Evil's present. Come on now, you're, you're validifying our whole point. Yet just on Friday, we were in the, the, the Cowley Center there. We were handing out leaflets in the homeless outreach. And a man came by, had himself a nice brimmed hat there. And he came walking by. Um, and he had a, in his magazine, interesting enough, it said, Judgment Day is coming. Now, he wasn't in any way interested in Judgment Day, but nevertheless, he, he happened to s slow down just for a little bit too long, trying to see what we were doing, and I began to talk to him. The man was a, a, a man who, who was most concerned about nature. He didn't think that there was a God. He was an absolute atheist. Um, and, and yet, a very clever man, a very condescending man, everything he said. And, and we, I talked to him for quite a while, and he kept saying that there's no evil. There's, there's bad, but there's no evil. He, he recognized that there were good things and there were bad things, but there was no evil behind it all. And so I asked him about who I think is probably one of the most evil men in, in human history. I asked him what he thought of Adolf Hitler. What do you think he said? He was abhorred by the man. He, he quickly said that, that he was absolutely wrong for killing the Jews. I said, where do you come up with such a conclusion? 
In a worldview like you have, couldn't that have just merely been survival of the fittest? Couldn't that have been just an, an okay thing? Can you really say that that was, that was bad and that was evil? And yet in his eyes, he, he, you could see that he understood in his deepest being that there is evil present in this world. With his lips, he said, no, there's just bad. Whatever distinction this is, I don't really know. But he adamantly denied evil. But deep in his heart, he knew of this wickedness. Where does that wickedness come from? The answer is in Genesis. Notice this. Now, let me just say this, first of all. There's more in this passage in Genesis 3 than, than we can touch on. We're trying to answer the question of what is man. And so we, we'll see more. We'll come back to this next week. But, but I want to point out some things about the, the nature of man that we find here. First of all, notice this, that God created man with a will. God created man with a will. In Genesis 2, we don't even get to Genesis 3, but in Genesis 2, the Bible says in verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Sounds pretty good. Eat whatever you want. All the trees. I don't know what kind of trees there were back then, but I'm sure there were the best of the best that could ever be imagined. Eat them all. Verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in, that, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. This is interesting. When God created man, God created man and He put him in the garden. He gave him a responsibility. And He said, whatever you want in this garden is yours. Everything. Fill your stomach with the lushest of fruits that this garden has to offer. But one tree, one tree, I'm sure there were hundreds, one tree, don't eat that. And in this, what we see is that God gave mankind the freedom of choice, the opportunity to choose. In the garden, Adam and Eve could have it all, but they would have to make the willful choice every time they saw that tree not to eat it. We know God is sovereign over all things, but we also must understand that God did not make us as robots. Man has a responsibility an opportunity to will, to choose his own path. Now obviously this is limited, but notice what this says. He, he gives them this opportunity to choose, and he says of this one tree, thou shalt not eat of it. This was a very, very interesting tree because it was a tree that possessed the knowledge of good and evil, or, or in other words, the, the knowledge of morality. When they opened it, they literally would be enlightened. Their eyes would be opened. But what it was, it was a one tree that man had to willfully choose to neglect. Therefore, every time he woke up and saw that tree, he would have to choose God's way and not his own way. He would have to say, I can't have that one. He would make that choice. And, 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 and what this really reminds us, can I just say this really quickly? The, 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 the truth is, is mankind is way more than instinct. We are not animals. Man has the will to choose. This morning when you woke up, you, you chose to get out of bed. You could have willed, you could have chose to stay in bed. We are not mere instinct. We're not mere chemical. The old scientists like to say that, that there's nothing more than, to us than chemical releases in our mind and brain. That's, that's absurd. Nobody believes that. You guys can keep saying it, but none of us believe it. Humanity is, is, is foolish, but most of us aren't that foolish. You think, we, we have the, the ability to choose. 
Tonight you chose to come here. Tonight you chose the clothes you put on. Tonight you chose not to do some things and to do other things. Why? Because the Lord has given us this will. It is the will of man that is enacted. And in fact, it's interesting. Uh, the, the, you, you talk, I talked to this man the other day uh, there on Friday, and, and he, he said he had love. I said, where do you get love from? He had no clue, of course. But he loved the world enough to try to fight for it. You know what's interesting about love? Is Love is an expression of the will. It is a choice. True love that we find in the Bible is always a choice. The love of God was a choice. There's nothing lovable about us. There's nothing nice about us. We broke His law, yet God chose to love us. Jesus chose to love us. As a husband, you must choose to love your wife. If your love is, is based on your feelings, it will be transient and it will pass as a wave through the ocean. Love, True love is a choice. It, not, it, it, it is an act of the will. And God gave Adam and Eve in the garden the choice to either love Him or willfully re and, and willfully resist the tree or to love themselves and willfully indulge in the tree. What do we learn? That God has given us a will. You have the choice tonight. I, I cannot strong arm you. I cannot wrestle you to respond. I cannot force you to believe what I'm teaching. And neither will God. God's given you that freedom. You say, I don't have to believe that. You're right. God made you that way. From the beginning, God gave man the will to choose. The freedom of the will, if you, are, if you will. Without choice, without the will, there would be no love. Only simple slavishness. Think about that for a second. Without choice, without will, there would be no will. There would be no love. We would simply just be robotic slaves. Man has a will. God created us that way. But here's the problem. Man had this opportunity to cho choose. To choose this tree, to neglect the tree, to refuse the tree. And I'm sure for some time he did all right. But then we get to chapter number 3. Verse number, three, verse number 1 of chapter number 3 says this, now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Man, God created man with a will. But notice secondly, that man's will is tried. Man's will is tried. Interestingly enough here, we speak really about the temptation that man has faced. Man's will is tried. Can I tell you, the trial of your will, that your choice would be tempted or allured or teased or, or, or drawn away in some way, is not sinful. It's when you act on that temptation that it becomes sin. We know this, if you read Matthew 4, Mark 1, or Luke 4, you find the temptation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's will was tried. He had the choice. He was tried. He was tempted. But he resisted. Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Mark 1.13, in the wilderness, 40 days tempted of Satan he was. 40 days and Satan tempted him. Three times the Bible tells us that Satan came and tried to draw his will away from the will of the Father. To draw him away. But what did Jesus do? He conquered. He made the right choice. He, he rose above the temptation and found God. You know that, that for you and I, there is always, the Bible actually says that if you're a believer, there is a way of escape. You can, through the power of Jesus Christ, the presence of the Spirit in your life, overcome temptation. But let me tell you this. 
1 Corinthians 10, 13, There is no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. Temptation is a common, regular, persistent occurrence. And if you are here tonight, you're human, and a couple things you can know is you've got the choice, but secondly, you need to know that that is going to be tempted and tried constantly. The Bible says this, that that they're in the garden, and and here's what happens. First of all, they face the tempter. Now the serpent. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelations that this serpent is the old dragon, is Satan himself, the devil. Satan himself slithering into the garden to tempt mankind. He is the tempter. And as he tempts, he allures, he draws, he tries, he tests, he entices, he persuades. Notice what it says of him, that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He comes in slowly, subtly, patiently, friendly. Temptation's going to come in your life. Don't think that because you have a will, you're going to always be victorious or you're not going to face trial. You're not going to face hardship. Temptation will come. Temptation will come, and it will come often in the form of a tempter or a temptress. Questioning the Word of God. Notice what he says there. More subtle, so sly, so crafty he was. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He begins by questioning the authority of God Himself. Come on. Did the Lord really say that? Then He goes on to say in verse number 4, Ye shall not surely die. He denies the Word of God. Verse number 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And he twists the Word of God. Think of that. Three things. He questions the Word of God, he denies the Word of God, and he twists the Word of God. Can I tell you that is exactly how Satan's going to get us? In fact, the, the greatest battle, the greatest the greatest tool, the greatest weapon against the tax of Satan is this book, Thy Word Have I Hid in My Heart. Why? That I might not sin against Thee. This is a weapon that God has given us, and Satan's going to do everything he can to get that weapon out of your hand and to bring victory over you. This is an interesting thought. Man has not sinned at this point. Eve has not sinned at this point. But evil is present. Not in her. Not in the world. But in Satan, Satan's already fallen. Satan's already thought himself better than God. He's already been cast out of heaven. He's already, with a third of the angels, been cast away. And yet here he is, bringing evil to the face of mankind as the tempter. As the tempter. Evil's already present before man has even even gotten close to it. The tempter comes. But with the tempter comes temptation. The temptation was the cause, as I already said, a, a questioning of God's authority. And since this time, since Genesis 3, 6,000 years ago, we believe, 6,000 years since this time, Mankind has questioned the authority of God. Mankind has said, come on, really God? Is that really what you want? Is that really what your word says? There are many Christians today who take, who take this book and twist it to mean what they want so that they can live however they please. Notice what the temptation is. Verse number 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit. Interesting. Three things there. She saw that the tree was good for food. 
She saw that it was pleasant to the eyes, and she saw that it was a tree desired to make one wise. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 16, the lust of the flesh, she saw that it was good for food. The lust of the eyes, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. And the pride of life, and a tree desired to make one wise. What, a, what an incredible temptation she faced. It was all bombarding her. And I want you to know this evening that you might think that you can, because you have a will, you're going to get past this sin by yourself. You're going to overcome it. You're a conqueror. You're a great human being. You're different than the rest of us. Can I tell you, you will not overcome the temptations of Satan. Satan has been tempting people and destroying people's lives for millennia. And to do the same with you. There are plenty of people in this world who think, I'm all right. I might do some bad things, but I choose some good things too. I'm a pretty good person. With my, with my own will, karma is on my side. Why in the world everybody thinks Hinduism karma is going to win, win the day for them? I don't know. But if I do some good deeds, it'll, it'll abolish all these bad deeds in my life. No, no, no luck. The tempter, the temptation, and finally, the tempted. God had given Adam and Eve a will. But now the temptation was to willfully choose their desires over God. This is the tempted. To love self and not God. To rebel. They have a will and are responsible for their choice. And tonight, you have a will, and you are responsible for your choice. How will you respond? Every time we are tempted, this is the fight in man. Will I choose God's way, or will I choose man's way? Let me tell you, let me, let me give you a little secret. I don't always give out all my secrets, but tonight I'm going to give you one. The Bible says that it is far easier to follow the will of man than to follow the will of God. In fact, the Bible calls it the broad way. The broad way. The broad way is wide and open, and everybody's going down it. That's the will of man. The way that says, this is, this is the way to do it. It's easy. It's good. It's comfortable. But can I tell you where the broad way leads? It leads to a place called hell. But the narrow way, now the narrow way is tough. The narrow way is rocky. The narrow way is harder to get past. But this is choosing God's will. God's way. And I wonder, when you are tempted, Christian, how will you fight? In your, in your body, in your inner man, will you fight? Will you choose God's way? Or you choose my way. A lot of people say that. My way or the highway. Don't choose your way. Choose God's way. This is what we see. That God has given man a will. Man's will is tried. Is tempted. And ultimately what we find in Genesis 3 is that man's will falls. Mankind falls. In a little sin. A little moment doesn't seem like a big deal, but that little sin would change humanity. Until this point, there was no evil in the world. There was no wickedness. There was no cancer. There were no suffering babies. There, were, there, were, there was no war and crime and, and issues. There was no moldy fruit. There was no rotten, rotten potatoes. Everything was perfect. But in a moment, the Bible says in verse number two, six, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Let me ask you, what is so bad about eating fruit? Why 
is it? That because Adam ate one fruit, all the world now has to die. I'll tell you, the, the, the problem is, and we get into, we move away from man and into who God is, but God is just. And the Bible says that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So one little disobedience, one little sin, is, is enough before God for eternity in hell. We serve an eternal God, and a God who is, is far beyond us. When, when we sin against Him, even if it's just the littlest of sin, we're guilty of the entire law, the Bible says. Her, her choice, his choice, his willful choice was a choice of rebellion against God. In that moment, in that sin, he said, I am God. I will choose what's right for me. God had said, this is what's right for you. Don't eat that tree. But man in that moment said, no, no, no. I'm in charge. I'm God. And that fruit is good for me. Sin. Rebellion. Disobedience. In that moment, sin entered the entire human race. Now there are only two of them in the world. But in that moment, they both partook. One man, one woman, both partaking of the fruit. A hundred percent of human beings were sinners. I don't know what, have, what would have happened if, if only Eve took. Or if only, well, if only Adam took, I think it would have passed upon all men still. But in that moment, man's perfect nature was corrupted, was broken. In that moment, think about this. Never before had a dead piece of skin fallen off of their body. In that moment, their body began to shed dead skin. They were dying. Sin nature would now be in who they were. They had opened the floodgates into, into their beings to commit treason against God, and now they would never get away from it. In, in fact, we know that this sin nature is, is, is something that is inherited. Now, had there been two couples, and one of the couples hadn't a sin, maybe there would have been a holy race and an unholy race. But the truth is, is there was one couple, they partook, and the Bible tells us that wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed, inherited upon all men, for that all have sinned. You realize that you're a sinner because your daddy was a sinner, and he's a sinner because his daddy was a sinner, and he's a sinner because his daddy was all the way back to Adam. The Bible says that as in Adam, all die. We are sinners because we've inherited it. And you say, well, I'm not that sinful. No, no, no. You have a sin nature. Your very nature, who you are, is broken. You say, well, what little, a, little bit, a little baby's not a sinner. No, no, maybe they haven't, but they've got a sin nature. They have all the capacity in them. Think of this. A little beautiful infant has all the capacity in them to turn out just like Hitler. Pol Pot. You and I have all the capacity in us to, to turn out that way. We are no different. That sin nature, that brokenness is, is present in all of us. Don't, don't be so foolish to think that you have escaped it. Ah, no, I, I might do some, that's what that man said, I do bad things, bad things happen, but I'm not evil. Come on, man. Who do you think you are? There, there is not just bad things. We are broken, sinful, wicked, and evil. Our nature is very broken. You and I individually all have the capacity in our sin nature to be like those vile men. 1 Corinthians 10.12 says, Wherefore, to let him that thinketh he standeth Take heed, lest he fall. All because of sin. 
What happens? Well, death passes upon all men. The, the world is cursed. The sin curse passes upon all men. In fact, the Bible goes on to say that, that Jesus, that God would, would curse man and women individually. Verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrows and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Do you realize that because of sin, birth is painful? I don't. It's incredible how quickly these two plunged all of humanity into sin. But prior to this, do you realize that there would have been no pain in birth? Childbearing would have been pain free. But God, because of sin, cursed the woman. And you say, well, that seems, that seems harsh. Well, notice what God does to humanity because of man. And unto Adam, verse 17, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. You realize that the woman's sin had a much smaller impact. It was very personal. But all of the world was cursed because of man's sin. The very ground which you walk upon is cursed because of the sin of Adam, of man. You can't, you can't, I'm sorry women, you can blame us for your pain. We can't blame you for your sin. There's something very in, in, in important here to notice. I, I do believe that the sin of a man will far greater impact his wife than the sin of a wife. Look at this. Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. You want to know why it's hard to work? You want to know why your, your face sweats and participates or precipitates when you're, when you're getting excited or working hard? It's because man is sinful. You remember that. Next time your back hurts, Next time you, you jab yourself on a, on a splinter, I've got a splinter in my finger right now. Next time you get a thorn or a thistle in your side, you remember that mankind is wretched. Mankind is sinful. We are broken. It, I don't understand how we can live in a world where a man can say, oh, there's good and there's bad, but there's no evil. Man, the very world in which we walk is broken. Everything about it. The benches squeak because they're broken. Everything about our world is, is cursed. The sweat of thy face in the sweat, thorns also and thistles, verse 18, shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return." You realize before this, there was no death. Our bodies now, when they die, they go into the ground. That was not what was going to happen before this sin passed upon all men. But man made a choice, a willful choice. God gave him a will. That will was tried, and man made a willful, sinful choice. One more thing I want to point out here. Is, is the conscience of man. When, when, when man, in his, will, willful, in his will, makes a choice, there is now a conscience inside of us that says that's bad and that's, that's, that's evil and that's good. Notice what it says in Genesis 3, verse 7. They, they both took, in verse number 6, they both took of the fruit, they ate of it. In verse number 7, it says this, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking on the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Why? Because they now had a conscience. They now had the ability to know, they had a moral code on their heart that said, that is good and that is evil. 
This is what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is. That tree, as they partook that fruit, it gave them a knowledge that they did not have before. It gave them the knowledge of morality. And now, what a, what a gracious thought that God, when, when man sinned, was gracious enough in that moment to let that sin, eating of the tree, also be the, the fruit that would give them the knowledge that they'd broken His law. Had they not eaten a tree of knowledge of good and evil, if, if God had said, that tree is bad, and it's the knowledge of, of water creatures, it wouldn't have helped them at all. They wouldn't have known that they had broken God's law. They wouldn't have had the knowledge, but God was gracious enough that in the moment of their sin, He also gave them the knowledge of good and evil, a conviction, a conscience, a morality was now seen. And in that moment, they take the fruit and the eyes of them were opened. They could see. And they knew immediately they were guilty before God. Oh, how many times they had heard the voice of the Lord in the cool of the day and never felt the guilt, never felt the shame, never felt the conviction, never felt the conscience saying, you are wrong. Hide yourself from God. Now they do. They had no conscience, no conviction, no morals. But what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing that this moral code has been written on the heart of man. And that same moral code is a reminder to us, to us all, that God exists. This very day, you know, and so did that man I talked to on Friday, he knew the difference between good and evil. He, he wouldn't have been so abhorred by the name of Adolf Hitler when I said it if he didn't know that evil was present in this world. He wouldn't care to save this earth. He thinks the earth's burning up from climate change. He wouldn't care if he didn't think evil, that wickedness was present in this world. But he knew because God has written the law in his heart. The, book, the Bible says in Romans Chapter 2. Now you may try with all you will to, to ignore this reality, but you know that you are a sinner. You know that you are broken. You look at this world and you know that you have come short of the glory of God. Romans 2, verse 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. You know cannibals don't eat their own people unless they've done something evil? They've got it in them. It's in them. They know the difference. Which, here it is, verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience. Their moral conscience. Their moral code. Bearing witness. And their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. Inside of man, because of the fall, because of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we inherit a conscience, a conviction, a, mora a morality. We, know we have the will to choose, but when we choose and we are tempted and we commit sin, we know that we have failed God. Can I tell you, the drunkard in the streets knows that he stands guilty before God. The murderer in, in his basement knows that he stands guilty before God. The aborigines, hidden away in some tribal part of, of the southern hemisphere, know that they are broken and need a, and need a God. We, we know that the, the world is seeking for a God. On, only in the, the modern philosophy of the Enlightenment have people thought, we don't need God anymore. And, and in the whole pursuit, they've put mankind as God. We're the ones that we need to pursue. It's called humanism. And, and it itself proves to, to the fact that they think mankind is now, this man that I spoke to on Friday, mankind's the head. Society tells us what's right and wrong. Hitler's society, though, was wrong. Why? His society said it was good to exterminate Jews. Why? Tell me why. No basis, no authority. You get, rid of, you get rid of God. 
You're wandering about. But yet in his heart, yet in the heart of all mankind, there is a conscience and a moral code. You're a sinner, and you know it. Crazy, isn't it? The fall of man. In a moment, in, in the time to reach up and grab a fruit, to bring it down to one's mouth and to eat it. The most condemning and damning curse, disease of all humanity touches all mankind. But we wouldn't be here if that was all that there was. We wouldn't be here if the only thing that we had to say was you're doomed and damned for all eternity. You know what's incredible? There is a way of salvation. There is a way that your and my sin can be dealt with. You say, I've got a sin nature. I'm broken. The tempter gets me. I fall every time. I'm, I'm, I'm a wicked man. I'm a wicked woman. I've got no hope. Can I tell you, you do have hope. God has made a way. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21. For since by man came death, by a human being, death came to all man. By man came also the resurrection of the life. The resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die. Are you in Adam tonight? Yes, you're human. You're in Adam. You physically have the flesh of your father, Adam. And because of that, you will die. You're a sinner. You're broken. Temptation destroys you. Sorry. But even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. The question tonight is, are you in Adam? You are definitely in Adam. I am in Adam. The question tonight is, are you in Christ? Are you in Him? Because if you are in Christ, the Bible says that all will be made alive. I wonder tonight, where is your hope? Do you know that there is, is a God in heaven who has made a way through Jesus Christ? We were once in Adam by physical birth, but will you be in Christ by spiritual birth? This was the great problem in John 3. A man by the name of Nicodemus. He was in Adam. He was a religious man, but he was in Adam. Physically a sinner. Tempted, destroyed, and broken with sin nature like the rest of us. But Jesus Christ told him that night, except ye be born again. That which is born of the flesh, that which is born of Adam, is of Adam. But that which is born of the Spirit, that which is born of Christ, is of the Spirit, is of Christ. Tonight, will you be born of Christ? The Bible says you can be, if you would simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, and be saved. Will you turn away from this wickedness? You don't have to let the tempter wreak havoc in your soul the day you die. You can have victory. 1 Corinthians 15 concludes with this. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. The law that's written on your hearts. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is He your Lord tonight? There is hope. Okay, we're broken, but there is hope. Jesus Christ has come. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ. You know, the answer for your soul is, is Jesus. It's not will, willful strength. Let me pull up all my will. I'm going to do something good for the day. I'm going to go for it. Your will, you can't pull your will together enough. Just because you have the choice does not mean that you will be victorious in choosing. And you will fall just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. The tempter will come, and you might win today, but he will come again, and you might win tomorrow, but he will get you. He will get you until you find victory in Christ and Christ alone. For as in Adam, all die. 
even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Let's pray. Father, we thank Thee that there is hope, that God, You have made a way of salvation through Your Son. Lord, please draw us unto that. Tonight I pray for the lost that are here. Would they hear Thy voice calling to them now? And would they respond? We pray these things in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 500, 549.